Thank you all for joining the JCRC's Holocaust Education Zoom course and to see the familiar faces that were here yesterday as well. We began yesterday by looking at European Jewish life before World War II and had a virtual tour of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. If you were unable to participate live with us, all of the 15 sessions are being recorded and will be available at the end of each week. We will send out the links to the recordings to all attendees, as well as post them on our website. And I'll put them in the chat here to make sure that you all have it. Additionally, you can still sign up for upcoming sessions via the registration link, and I'll also include that in the chat. Today's session is on the history of anti-Semitism. My two colleagues, Laura Zell and Sammy Rahamin, are presenting. Laura is the Director of Holocaust Education at the JCRC, and Sammy is the Public Affairs and Communications Associate here. Please know you can use the bottom of the screen, the chat function to ask questions. And we will take a few minutes at the end of the hour to answer as many questions as we're able. So with no further ado, thank you so much for being here and supporting the work of the JCRC. And Laura and Sammy can take it away. Thanks, Susie. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Laura Zell. Um, and today we, Sam and I just want to take a minute before we start, a moment before we start and remember um, the Tree of Life synagogue uh, anti-Semitic hate crime that took place two years ago. Um, it's um, the tragedy that will tie all of this obviously together on the importance of why we need to continue to talk about this, why we can't educate enough about this and why we need all of you to help us be allies in this work. So today for this class, as Susie mentioned, we're gonna give um, an overview about anti-Semitism. We wanna tie it into historical um, pieces of information and then bring it to contemporary examples and then also leave time for question and answer. But before we get into our first um, lesson about this, Sammy and I very much want to recognize that this, this anti-Semitism, which has been around for century, centuries, is not something that we want to define the Jewish people. Um, while, so we put up this quote from Rabbi Sachs, the only sane response to anti-Semitism is to monitor it, fight it, but never let it affect our idea of who we are. Pride is always a healthier response than shame. This is something that the JCRC takes to heart. This is the reason we build relationships across many cultures, across many religions. This is really how we do our work. Um, even when we talk about the Jews as victims during the Holocaust, we don't want to leave um, anybody as a victim in, in uh, any sort of history. So we very much try to make sure that we understand that this is not something that defines us. So let's start with the definition. I'm going to read this. Um, a form of anti Semitism is a form of hatred, mistrust, and contempt for Jews based on a variety of stereotypes and myths, which often invokes the belief that Jews have extraordinary influence with which they conspire to harm or control society. Anti Semitism can target Jews as individuals or as a group or as a people, and it can target the state of Israel as a Jewish entity. One of, if you were on the class yesterday with Kristen, one of the ways that um, she pointed out that this targets groups, Jews as a group of people was the fact in the map that she put up that pointed to the fact that in Germany at the rise of Nazism, Jews made up less than 1% of the population in that entire country. So the the um, groundedness that Jews were targeted as a group and made as an other in society hits very much home, especially in this definition. Sammy, please take it away. Thanks, Laura. And so one piece we also want to focus on is the difference between anti-Semitism and racism. 
and make sure that we understand that, you know, of course, both are forms of prejudice and bias, um, but that racism often involves a clear power dynamic, which can make it easier to spot where one group sees itself as superior uh, to another group. Um, however, anti-Semitism often looks at Jews as being stronger, being um, almost super naturally strong. And we'll take a look at that uh, as well as the cause of social problems. Turning back for a little bit of history, uh, although anti-Jewish hatred can be traced into the ancient world, and here we see a depiction of the Israelite slaves in, in Egypt, the word anti-Semitism, the word we use in today's vocabulary as the term to, to mean anti-Jewish hatred, is a modern invention that emerged in the wake of rising European nationalism, uh, German journalist Wilhelm Marr is responsible for coining the term uh, with his founding of the League of Anti-Semites uh, in 1879. And today Marr is often called the father of anti-Semitism, not only for inventing a name, but for clarifying the crazed logic behind the term toward Jews, that hating Jews is not just about a matter of ancestry or culture or faith, but that it really means a, a disqualification for friendship, for citizenship. And uh, as we understand through our learning about the Holocaust, a disqualification from humanity in the eyes of the Nazis. But turning back even further, for centuries before the term anti-Semitism emerged, Jews were persecuted as a minority group whose loyalties were questioned by polytheistic cultures and then later Christian and Islamic regimes. Uh, though some ancient societies did admire Jews for their ethics, monotheism, um, Jews often paid a terrible price for religious differences and statelessness. And that statelessness was a, a result of what we see here, um, the destruction of the second temple um, during the brutal Roman occupation of ancient Israel uh, in the year 70 CE. And this event uh, dramatically ruptured uh, the Jewish collective experience in a religious, political, um, and collective social sense. It, it drove Jews into diaspora, uh, settling all over the world. In, in many cases, Jews did live in prosperous communities that were upheld by traditions that evolved following uh, the Roman destruction of the temple. Personally, in my case, uh, my family roots trace back to ancient Persia, to modern day Iran, which had one of the most vibrant Jewish communities anywhere in the world. And as we discussed yesterday, Laura's family uh, traces back to, to Greece. Um, however, Jewish history is also marked by periods of intense persecution um, in many of these places uh, across the globe. Um, some well-known examples that we'll touch on uh, include the Spanish Inquisition, Tsarist pogroms, and of course, the, the Holocaust. So now we wanna explore the seven prominent myths and Sammy and I are gonna use the ADL's Anti-Semitism Uncovered, a guide to old myths in a new era. Um, like we said before, for each myth, we're going to define it, we're going to provide historical context, a contemporary example, and a call to action. Um, you can find this guide online at ADL.org. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Laura. Uh, <laughs> the first myth that we're looking at is that Jews have too much power. The fact of the matter is that Jews account for approximately 0.2% of the global population. And yet anti-Semites believe that this tiny minority is not only on a quest for global domination, but is already in control of the banks, the media, uh, industry, government, and in some cases, even the weather. How did this come to be? 
Ideas and fears about Jewish power were codified in the early 20th century with the publication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is an elaborate forgery uh, reporting supposed meeting that never occurred. It was the Tsarist secret police in Russia that first circulated portions of the protocols, which were purported to be leaked minutes from secret meetings of Jewish leaders who were conspiring to take over the world. The protocols falsely revealed a purported Jewish plan for global domination, how they would take over industries, infiltrate governments, and use their stranglehold on the media to advance a hidden agenda. No such meeting had ever occurred, and the document was a pure fiction, an elaborate forgery. Nevertheless, they attracted much attention and it was translated into multiple languages and disseminated around the world. They also gained traction in the United States among such noted anti-Semites is automaker Henry Ford, who published a series of anti-Semitic articles based on the protocols in his weekly newspaper in which he would eventually republish in the book, The International Jew. As Sammy mentioned, it was translated into 16 languages and both Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels, later head of the propaganda ministry, praised Ford and the International Jew publication. Today, in many parts of the world, the protocols remains widely read and accepted as fact. World leaders such as Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey or Mahathir Mohammed of Malaysia still blame this sinister Jewish conspiracy for their country's misfortunes. The protocols is featured for sale at many book fairs across the Arab world. The Islamic Republic of Iran and its proxies still peddle the protocols as a sin sinister form of statecraft, enshrining it as state policy and using it to justify their irrational hatred for Jews around the world and for the Jewish state. Later, we could see a example of the Nazi regime trying to use this idea of Jewish power, Jewish influence, uh, by dropping this leaflet that you see here uh, over American troops uh, during World War II. It says, who rules the United States? That uh, to try and sow doubt among American soldiers that they, they weren't fighting an American war, they were fighting a Jewish war. And it wasn't just the German Nazis who sought to deliver that message, that sentiment had a following back home too. American aviator Charles Lindbergh delivered an infamous speech at a rally in Des Moines, Iowa, where he accused three groups, the British, the Roosevelt administration, and the American Jews of agitating for war. And he argued that the greatest danger to this country lies in, Jews on, in the Jewish ownership and influence in our motion pictures, our press, our radio, and our government. Critics roundly condemn Lindbergh's words as anti-Semitic. A central figure in today's conspiracy theories is also his Hungarian Jewish billionaire, philanthropist and Holocaust sur survivor, George Soros, who is widely recognized for funding progressive political and social causes. Soros's philanthropy often is recast as a fodder for outsized, consp outsized conspiracy, excuse me, conspiracy, theories, including claims that he masterminds specific global plots or manipulates particular events to further his goals. Many of these conspiracy theories employ long-standing anti-Semitic myths, particularly the notion that rich and powerful Jews work behind the scenes plotting to control countries and manipulate global events. And as we mentioned at the start of today's program. Today is indeed the two-year anniversary of the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in American history when 11 lives were claimed at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and so we really appreciate you being with us today uh, to 
commit to using our voices, uh, growing our knowledge, and building a society where attacks like this do not happen. But part of preventing anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence includes understanding what makes it possible. And so the killer in this instance frequently posted on far right social networking sites like the screenshots you see here from a platform called Gab. He subscribed to the conspiracy theory called white genocide, which suggests that demographic and social changes underway in the United States and other particularly Western countries, these changes including immigration, admission of refugees, an increase in mixed race marriages, uh, mixed race children, and generally support for multiculturalism and feminism are all part of a secret plot to destroy the white race. Uh, and uh, uh, you've got a sense of this um, embodied in the 2017 march in, in Charlottesville, uh, where uh, marchers with torches were shouting, Jews will not replace us. Uh, that's what they, they're talking about here, not literally Jews, replacing them in society, but Jews being the masterminds to um, increase the population of people of color and decrease the power of white Americans. Um, so a plot that is this grand and, and this complicated uh, must have a mastermind, of course. And in these far right circles, it often takes the form of, of George Soros, who we just spoke about. Um, and also using, in this case, Hias, the Jewish nonprofit that advocates for refugees and does some just really amazing work. And the JCRC is proud to partner with Hias on many occasions. Um, and before the shooting in Pittsburgh, Hias had recently organized a national refugee Shabbat to something they've continued to do. Um, and one of the part congregations within the Tree of Life Synagogue had participated uh, in that program uh, and, and appeared on this list, on this website, and that is how they became the, the shooter's target. Uh, you see this um, post on the left side, highest likes to bring invaders in that kill our people. I can't sit by and watch my people get slaughtered. Screw your optics, I'm going in. This was just hours before the attack took place. So now we'll watch a brief video to understand how this phenomenon played out with this particular conspiracy theory. When the migrant caravan started making its way to the U.S. from Honduras, so did something else, conspiracy theories that billionaire George Soros was paying people to join. On October 14th, Loretta Maliki, going by Loretta the Prole on Twitter, with more than 6,000 followers, posted about the caravan with a single word comment, Soros. Within minutes, groups reaching 165,000 members had parroted her implication. This isn't the first time allegations like this have circulated. In fact, naming the billionaire founder of the Open Society Foundations has become a buzzword for discrediting protest movements. Accusers claim Soros paid protesters at Trump rallies, Black Lives Matter, and even the Kavanaugh hearing. He's been a magnet for such lies worldwide, garnering bizarre accusations like the Holocaust survivor was actually a Nazi collaborator and that he paid dogs to attend protests in Romania. Soros has been declared public enemy number one in his home country of Hungary, as the state struggles to deflect accusations of corruption and increasing authoritarianism. Stories like these are often born on alt-right sites like Gab and 4chan, but they really go wild when they hit mainstream platforms like Facebook and Twitter. This and others have been recirculated by the likes of high-profile and public figures like Roseanne Barr, Representative Matt Gates, and President Donald Trump. By October 27th, the caravan lie had reached hundreds of millions of users on mainstream social media and even made its way to cable news. So as you can see, the myth is as false as it is dangerous. Jews are not monolithic. We do not act as one to advance a particular unified agenda. Our interests are diverse as are our, our identities. 
The great irony of the myth about Jewish power is that historically Jews have had very little influence or control over their own fate. The pogroms of the 19th century and the genocide of the Holocaust in the 20th century are just the two tragic reminders from recent history of the powerlessness that Jews ultimately have experienced. Moving on to our second myth is the myth that Jews are disloyal or often referred to as dual loyalties. Anti-Semites often suspect Jews of holding allegiances only to fellow Jews or to a uniquely Jewish agenda. And Jews are accordingly seen as untrustworthy neighbors and citizens as if they are inherently disloyal because of their Jewishness. One of the most infamous cases of the disloyalty charge is known as the Dreyfus Affair, in which a French Jewish military officer was convicted in a military court of allegedly passing French secrets to Germany. While later discovered evidence that the real culprit was a French army major who is not Jewish, the military engaged in a cover-up to protect the supposedly loyal French officer while continuing to cast Dreyfus as a treasonous Jew, despite evidence that he was not the culprit. While Dreyfus's sentence was eventually overturned, the entire affair underscored a widespread mistrust of Jews in enlightened France in the late 19th century. So you can see from this Austrian postcard from 1919, um, the, that exact disloyalty at play here with the Jew backstabbing a German soldier. Um, this was following German's defeat, Germany's defeat in World War I, at, where Hitler and other anti-Semites baselessly blamed German Jew soldiers for stabbing their army in the back. Hitler thus staked future victories for Germany on the eradication of Jews, who you can see how he then spread the word or tried to convince people that they were disloyal. See the myth. Here's a modern day example of this stereotype playing out. Uh, during an interview with Bernie Sanders in 2015, NPR host Diane Rehm said to Sanders, Senator, you have dual citizenship with Israel. Even when Sanders immediately corrected her and said he does not have dual citizenship with Israel, Rehm pressed on, telling him that his name was on a list of Jewish lawmakers with dual citizenship. Shockingly, Reem admitted that she got this information, misinformation, from a comment on Facebook. This story just simply illustrates the potency of anti-Semitic myths, including this one, uh, and that someone as a professional accomplished journalist uh, could pick up something like that and not really question it um, is really shocking. But in a nation of immigrants, as we are here in America, People can be loyal American citizens and still feel emotional attachments to other countries. And you know, we, th this is not so different from how say Korean Americans would feel about Korea, Indian Americans about India. Um, and we should really be proud of our, our heritage and, and also uh, not have to live in a society where our loyalty to our country is in question. The next myth we're gonna talk about is greed. Um, it's one of the most prominent and persistent stereotypes about Jews is that Jews are greedy, hoping to make themselves rich by any means. They're, they are seen both as relentless in the pursuit of wealth and also as stingy misers determined not to let any money slip from their grasp. They are imagined to exert control over the world's financial systems but are also accused of regularly cheating friends and neighbors out of a buck. This is an Italian poster from 1944. Oops, sorry, Sammy, went ahead a little bit. Go ahead. So the stereotype of Jewish greed did take hold in the Middle Ages when Jews were frequently associated with money. Jews typically had restrictions placed on their economic activity and were sometimes prohibited from owning land. Sometimes the only option available 
to earn a living in such circumstances was through high interest crediting, a role in which the Christian rulers of these societies sometimes recruited Jews as Christians were prohibited from it. This made for a complicated and tense dynamic between Jews and Christian society that lasted well beyond medieval times. Jews were often made the villains in literature and art of the time, reflecting a widespread depiction of Jews as unscrupulous, money hungry, and working against the interest of the honest citizen. A famous character in literary history is Shylock, the greedy Jewish money lender in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. Eventually, this stereotype worked its way into the modern vernacular. To Jew someone down became a common expression, meaning to bargain unscrupulously for a lower price. This phrase is still used today and is highly offensive. The notion of greed can also be found in a Germ German children's book called The Poisonous Mushroom. Here, this picture is called Cheating Jews. The negative stereotype now is being taught in the schools through this curriculum, um, trying to convince children that it's true. And this now begins to set a course for national policy to take hold and eventually discriminatory national laws. So much so in 1935 that the Nuremberg laws racially defined Jews by quote blood and ordered the total separation of so-called Aryans and non-Aryans, thereby legalizing a racist hierarchy. And a modern example of this myth playing out with real world consequences came in 2006 in France where Ilan Halimi, a 23 year old Jewish Frenchman was kidnapped, tortured for three weeks and murdered by a gang in Paris that was hoping to extract a half a million dollars in ransom money from his family. They had assumed that because he was Jewish, he'd be rich. But in fact, Halimi was a cell phone salesman of modest means whose working class North African family belied the stereotype. The truth is that Jews, like all other people, exist across the spectrum of socioeconomic status. It's wrong to assume that a high proportion of wealthy Jews signifies Jewish greed. It's also wrong to assume that their money is put to harmful uses. Lastly, it's wrong to assume that all Jews are even wealthy in the first place. Keeping these truths in mind, we must remember that even when it's intended as a compliment, statements like Jews are good with money or all Jews are well off contribute to a dangerous stereotype. The next myth that we're gonna talk about is deicide. The myth that Jews collectively murdered has been used to justify violence against the Jews for centuries. Historians as well as Christian leaders have agreed that the claim is baseless. Jesus was crucified in Jerusalem sometime around 30 CE and Pontius Pilate then serving as the Roman governor of Judea both presided over the trial of Jesus and gave the order for his crucifixion. One of the earliest and clearest examples of the deicide accusation appears in the book of Matthew, which was only written several decades after the event. When Pontius Pilate second guesses his decision to have Jesus crucified, Jews are caricatured as a bloodthirsty lynch mob. This narrative is patently false. While certain leaders in the local Jewish community felt that Jesus and his teachings were politically subversive, experts have gathered that Jesus was not perceived as particularly threatening or enraging to the Jews around him. Modern readers misinterpret the trial of Jesus as a conflict between Jews and Christians, but this does not square with the fact that the Jewish, that Christianity has its origins in Judaism or with the fact that Jesus and Christianity rather emerged only years after Jesus's death. In revisiting again the book, The Poisonous Mushroom, you will find this picture in the caption that says, whenever you see a crucifix, think of the horrible murder of Jesus by the Jews. The Nazis, as we know, use this common belief to further alienate Jews. Some Aryan symbols actually appear in the symbol, such as the bright hair, the connection to nature, children, 
and the continuous the continuous strand of the race of the Aryan race. So these repeated themes of who was accepted, who was considered the in group, who was the us, grow even stronger as people are reinforced in their attitudes and beliefs around this myth. After all, you can't create a social construct of an us without alienating the them group. So we see that the poisonous mushroom was a powerful media entity at the time, particularly among children. And in our generation, uh, it was the Mel Gibson film, The Passion of the Christ, which uh, uh, depicted Pontius Pilate as being entirely reluctant to sentence Jesus. And fictitiously, he is blackmailed into submission by Jewish authorities. And only then does he go through with the sentencing. This film is a Hollywood rendition of a long-standing tradition referred to as passion plays or Easter pageants depicting the passion of Jesus, his trial, suffering, and death. It is a traditional part of Lent in several Christian denominations and was especially so in the, in the Catholic tradition. Many passion plays historically encouraged anti-Semitism by blaming Jews collectively for the death of Jesus and led to pogroms and other violent acts against Jewish communities, especially in Europe. Then we come to 1964, where the Catholic Church discredits the notion of the Jewish deicide in papers called Nostra Aetate. They're published by the Second Vatican Council. And in no uncertain terms, the declaration states that the crucifixion of Jesus cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction, then alive, nor against the Jews of today. At the JCRC, we celebrate and program around Nostra Aetate with our Catholic partners as a symbol of progress and the strong relationships our communities hold. In the long history of Jewish scapegoating, deicide is the original and most damning false accusation. It set the terms for the most foundational Christian theological combinations of Jews and Judaism within eras and cultures where the church was the most influential institution in society. The notion of Jewish deicide might seem like harmless historical speculation, but in fact, those who spread the myth are usually less concerned with historical facts than they are with demonizing Jews. In any case, Historians and theologians agree, Jews are not responsible for the death of Jesus, not then and not now. A major theme in anti-Semitic thought and propaganda is something called the blood libel, the myth that Jews murder non-Jews, particularly non-Jewish children, in order to use their blood to perform religious rituals. Most prevalent in the medieval and early modern period, this peculiar accusation has incited violence against Jews for centuries. Jewish religious law forbids the consumption of any blood, human or animal, but accusations of ritual murder serve to dehumanize Jews and justify their persecution. Despite the fact that no historical or religious truth supports such accusations, this concept was used to justify the pillaging, torture, burning alive, and expulsion of countless Jews. The origins of the blood libel date back to the Middle Ages, when the first accusation against Jews for allegedly killing Christian children emerged in 12th century England following the death of a boy named William in Norwich. Years later, a monk, Thomas of Monmouth, blamed the local Jews for the boy's murder accusing them of killing William in a perverse reenactment of Jesus's crucifixion. Thomas of Monmouth's conspiracy theory, which he codified in his book, The Life and Passion of William of Norwich, took on a broader mythological status and spread throughout the European continent. In the, year, in the years preceding the Holocaust, Nazi propagandists used the blood libel to make the case that Jews were a menace to German society. The Nazi tabloid Der Sturmer devoted an entire issue to the blood libel and accusations of a Jewish plan to murder non-Jews. 
Dostromer was often posted on city kiosks so people could gather and read the daily news in the town square. And oftentimes when you listen to survivor testimony, testimony a horrifying pattern be becomes apparent. They often speak of their neighbors, their, class, their schoolmates spewing these anti-Semitic myths. The widespread acceptance of these myths is part of what enabled the Holocaust to happen. The blood libel remained a powerful call to anti-Semitic violence even after the Holocaust. We can see here in 1946, an accusation of the blood libel incited a vicious attack on Jews in Poland, which resulted in the death of dozens of Jews and forced many more to flee. And still in recent decades, we have seen the blood libel wielded as a political tool. In 1991, for example, a Syrian delegate read charges of the blood libel on the floor of the UN Human Rights Commission. Some anti-Zionist cartoons and publications have also incorporated the blood libel myth with imagery of Israeli leaders either drinking or involved with Palestinians' blood, and especially Palestinian children. So you see here in this cartoon, uh, a depiction of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu shown with a bloody hand smiling over a presumably dead Palestinian infant, uh, insinuation that Netanyahu murdered the baby, leaving it for the Muslim family, symbolized by the man's crescent head in the month of Ramadan. And one final example of the blood libel comes from the manifesto of the synagogue shooter in Poe, California, who referenced Simon of Trent, and if you're paying close attention to the captions, is the boy who is depicted uh, on the left side of the screen in that woodcut from the 14th century in Italy. And it address this myth, the blood libel, that ignorance and hateful biases uh, allow dangerous myths to persist even today. These accusations, unfortunately, continue to endanger Jewish communities as deranged individuals, such as the synagogue shooter in Poway, uh, continue to believe these myths. References to the blood libel and other accusations of ritual murder must be taken seriously and challenged in order to dissipate this toxic myth. Now we're gonna move on to denial. As we established yesterday, and we'll continue to course, the Holocaust was a genocide perpetuated by the German Nazi regime between 1941 and 1945, in which European Jews were targeted for wholesale annihilation, with 6 million Jewish civilians murdered in death camps, concentration camps, ghettos, killing fields, and elsewhere. In the face of extensive credible evidence, volumes of governmental documents, thousands of eyewitness testimonies, first-hand admission of guilt, photographs, film footage, meticulously written records, museums worth of artifacts, not to mention the remains of the concentration camps, gas chambers, and crematoria themselves, there are ongoing efforts to distort, disprove, and conceal the facts of the Holocaust. There are those who simply denied the Holocaust ever happened, and those who in a variety of ways diminish the Holocaust. Holocaust deniers operate on a spectrum from trivializing the genocide to alleging its falsification. Implicitly and explicitly, Holocaust deniers argue that this entire chapter of history is an elaborate hoax by Jewish propagandists who simply wanted reparations from Germany, the creation of a Jewish state and a distraction from their own double dealing. In a sense, Holocaust denial is as old as the Holocaust itself. Nazi bureaucrats were careful to cover up the final solution in bureaucratic language. Jews were not deported, but resettled. Ghettos were, not cordoned, were just cordoned off for quarantine, and a death march was merely an evacuation. One notorious instance of Nazi falsification involves Theresienstadt a transit camp in the former Czechoslovakia that the Nazis pretended was simply a resettlement community. When the International Red Cross demanded to investigate the camp's living conditions in 1944, 
the Nazis forced Jewish prisoners to plant flowers and decorate the, the barracks. The Nazis even fabricated a promotional film of Theresienstadt in which prisoners were coerced to perform cheerfulness, as you see in this photo, for the cameras in exchange for food. In reality, more than 30,000 prisoners died in Theresienstadt and nearly 90,000 more were deported to death camps. In one of its most developed forms, Holocaust denial is an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that claims Jews around the world knowingly fabricated evidence of their own genocide in order to extract reparations from Germany, like we said before, and gain world sympathy and facilitate the alleged theft of Palestinian land for the creation of Israel. It is founded on the belief that Jews somehow are able to force major institutions, governments, Hollywood, the media, academia, to promote a lie at the expense of non-Jews. But there have been some important victories against Holocaust denialism, such as the successful defense in an English court by historian Deborah Lipstadt against anti-Semitic writer David Irving. As opposed to in the US where the defendant is presumed innocent, in the UK in a libel case, the defendant has to prove that they did not libel the plaintiff, meaning essentially that Professor Lipstadt had to prove that the Holocaust happened. Indeed, since the 1980s, Holocaust denial has migrated from pseudo-academic journals and conferences to the post-truth world of the internet. Today, a younger generation of Holocaust deniers is active on social media sites, uh, including Facebook and Twitter, but of course, the alt-right sites that we mentioned earlier. And it was just a couple of weeks ago that Facebook finally took official action to address Holocaust denial on its platform, a much overdue victory uh, for truth in, in that sense. Moreover, with the passage of time, historical distance from the Holocaust contributes for some to the disbelief that it occurred. According to many polls, we see rising and alarming numbers of young people and people of all ages, frankly, who do not believe that the Holocaust happened. So in most cases, a healthy debate promotes understanding. Certain matters are closed for discussion. For good reason, we don't argue whether the earth is flat, nor should we argue, argue about whether the Holocaust happened. It did. Arguments against this fact reveal little about history and much about the arguer, arguer's wish for the world to replace memories of Jewish victimization with a monolithic image of Jews as powerful and treacherous. Holocaust trivialization is not exactly synonymous with denial or with anti-Semitism, but is nonetheless a form of Holocaust distortion and frankly, much more common in the public discourse these days than traditional Holocaust denial. Holocaust trivialization a definition could be that it in the application of language that is specific to the Holocaust and describing events related to the Holocaust to purposes that are unrelated to it. This trend is far from new, but it is escalating at a disturbing rate in increasingly polarizing times. When the, the Holocaust has been reduced in some cases to shorthand as good versus evil. It is the epithet to end all epithets. And in the current environment of you know, rapid fire online communication, uh, viral memes and vitriol from both one side of the political aisle to the other, uh, this type of language lends itself to uh, lots of sloppy analogizing. And earlier this summer, we saw numerous Minnesota politicians and partisan groups comparing the governor's mask mandate and other measures to stop the spread of COVID to Nazi persecution of Jews. Careless Holocaust analogies may demonize, demean, and intimidate their targets, but there is a cost for all of us because they distract from the real issues challenging our society. They shut down productive, thoughtful discourse at a time when our country needs 
dialogue more than ever. It is especially dangerous to exploit the memories of the Holocaust to some political points. We owe the survivors more than that, and we owe ourselves more than that. As the Holocaust recedes in time, some Americans are becoming increasingly, and, and Europeans are becoming increasingly casual and disrespectful to this mass murder. Just as, we, just as we have seen Minnesotans misuse the memory of the Holocaust to score political points, as Sammy mentioned, we have seen young Minnesotans misuse the Holocaust on social media. Um, you can read this on the left was a TikTok example that was posted uh, earlier this summer and on the right was an Instagram post um, by high school students. For this myth and all the others that we've covered, we really encourage you to speak up when you see this. This is something that has tentacles out on social media far more than we could ever have predicted. And it's up to all of us to react to it in, in the uh, most accurate way. That's right, thanks, Laura. And uh, our last myth that we're gonna look at today uh, is anti related to anti-Zionism and the idea that criticism of Israel is never anti-Semitic, that being the myth. Um, sadly, much of contemporary anti-Zionism or the delegitimization of Israel and its supporters draws on and perpetuates anti-Semitic tropes. Now I'll back up here for a moment and just make sure that we all have a clear understanding of what Zionism is. Zionism being the movement for Jewish self-determination and statehood, it reflects the ancient longing of Jews to return to our ancestral homeland in the land of Israel. Its development as a modern movement reflects a historical moment in which numerous groups sought freedom from imperial movements, from imperial rule, excuse me, through movements to cultivate a and protect their identity and community peoplehood as a nation. Nationalism, it was uh, kind of the thing at the time. Zionism actualized that concept for the Jews and brought up a situation where Jews do have a safe haven. And now there, there really is no such thing as, as a Jewish refugee because they will always have a place to go. I'll also note that Zionism is a big tent politically that includes diverse views about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and about how to promote peace or support a two-state solution. And the bottom line is also that the vast majority of Jews around the world feel a connection or kinship with Israel, whether or not they explicitly identify as Zionists and whatever their position on specific Israeli government policies. Consciously or not, among today's anti-Zionist leaders, those who engage in harsh delegitimization of Israel are often individuals who thinly dis disguise irrational hatred toward Jews and use age-old Jewish anti-Jewish rhetoric in their charges against Zionism and Israel. For example, invoking dual loyalty, or in this case, in the cartoon of Uncle Sam that you know, we're really the, the puppet masters pulling the strings here and, and that it's Jewish power that um, results in American support for Israel as opposed to, you know, Americans generally, the vast majority of whom are non-Jewish supporting Israel and a U.S.-Israel relationship. So... We know that it is possible to have legitimate criticism of Israel. This is how we uh, would address the myth that we would say uh, that when critics delegitimize, demonize, or, or hold Israel to a double standard, you know, it is anti-Semitism. One can absolutely promote Palestinian rights and nationhood without denying that same right to Israel, a consistent Jewish refuge from anti-Semitism. And, and as we see here in this cartoon, this is something we see far too often where Israel's treatment of Palestinians is compared to the actions of the Nazis. It's important to look at the motives and intents behind the people criticizing Israel. Do they believe in the right of the Jewish people, like all people, to self-determination? Do they recognize the 3,000-year connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel? 
Do they accept the state of Israel as a legitimate proposition or are they amenable to its destruction? Do they make fact-based arguments to criticize specific policies or instead demonize the entire country, its citizens and its supporters? These are the questions we should be asking ourselves when we are wondering whether a particular criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Israeli policies and leadership should be criticized just as with any other country. However, when that ostensible criticism uh, steps over these boundaries, uh, that can be an indication of anti-Semitism. So we covered a lot today, um, but we hope that you'll understand the faulty logic, the persistence of these anti-Semitic myths. Um, you have seen examples of what forms each myth can take. You know why each one is wrong. If you put this knowledge to action, you can help us prevent anti-Semitism from growing in today's world and contribute to maintaining a civil society in which hate-based ideologies have no place. So now we'll, we're happy to take some questions. If you wanna post them in the chat, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Sammy and Laura, so much for presenting on this overview of anti-Semitism. And thank you all for attending today. Um, tomorrow's session is on the rise of Nazism. We'll explore the conditions that existed in Germany that allowed Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party to seize power and ultimately allowed the Holocaust to take place. And again, if you are not registered, you can um, continue to register for the next for the remaining 15. So today's the second, we're doing it for the remaining of the next three weeks, this week, the following two. And that link I gave you is on our website so you can go there to register as well. Thank you all very much.